So, how does this relate to the Kalman filter? Well, the Kalman filter actually gives us the analytical solution to the filtering equations for linear and Gaussian models. It does this recursively, that is, at each time step k, it computes first the predicted density, the distribution of x, k, given all the measurements up to k minus 1, and it computes this as a Gaussian density. That is, we calculate the mean of it, which call this x hat k given k minus 1, and the covariance, we call this p k given k minus 1. And then secondly, it calculates the posterior density, the distribution of x k given measurements up to time k. And again, this is also computed as a Gaussian density with a mean x hat k given k and p k given k. And this is done for all k's from 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And again, we call this here the prediction step, calculating the predicted density. And then we call this the update step, where we calculate the posterior updated density. So here we see one of the strengths of the linear and Gaussian models. As all densities are Gaussian, and a Gaussian distribution is defined by its mean and its covariance. We only need to compute these two moments in each step. So we need to compute the mean and covariance of the predicted density in the prediction step, and the mean and covariance of the posterior density in the update step. That's all we need to do. So now we're going to look at how the Kalman filter calculates these means and covariances. We start by looking at the prediction step and how to calculate the mean and covariance of the predicted density. If you remember from a previous lecture where we looked at linear transformations of Gaussian random variables, you will probably recognize these expressions. So if you recall the linear and Gaussian process model like this, where xk is equal to ak minus 1 times xk minus 1 plus some process noise, qk minus 1. So this is the linear and Gaussian process model. And if you recall, we also assume that the posterior from the previous time instance is a Gaussian density. So the posterior from the previous time instance, like this, given all the measurements up to k minus 1. We assume that this is a Gaussian density of xk minus 1 with a mean x hat k minus 1 given k minus 1 and a covariance pk minus 1 given k minus 1. So if we put these things together, we can derive the mean of the uh, of the predicted <coughs> density, like this. So by definition, the mean of the predicted density is the expected value of xk given measurements up to k minus 1. If we insert our process model into this expression, so we exchange xk for our process model, we can write this as a k minus 1. So remember that we assume that the expected value of our process noise, q k minus 1, is zero mean. So q k is the zero mean Gaussian random variable with covariance q k minus 1. So the expected value of q k minus 1 is equal to zero. So expected value of this, if we condition on the previous measurements, are ak minus 1 times our estimate, our mean from the previous time instance, right? So this expression then becomes simply ak minus 1 times our posterior mean from the previous time instance. And that's exactly what we have up here, right? So assuming that our process noise is zero mean, so this is the expression for the predicted mean. So what we see is that we get the predicted mean by simply translating the posterior mean from the previous time instance 
by multiplying by the transition matrix. The predicted covariance can be derived in a similar manner, and we then end up with this expression here. Again, the posterior covariance is translated by the transition matrix, AK minus one, and then we need to add the covariance of our process noise, QK minus one. We should note some important things here. Firstly, for these equations to hold true, we need to assume that the process noise is zero mean. So the process noise here is a zero mean. And I would encourage you to think about how you would need to change these equations here if this was not the case. Secondly, as we'll see when we look at the update step, only the posterior mean is dependent on the observations from 1 to k minus 1. One consequence of this, for example, is that our uncertainty in the state, as described by the covariance matrix, uh, pk given k minus 1 in this case, is not dependent on data and can thus be pre-computed and will eventually become constant over time. And now to the update step, we want to correct the predicted estimate with the information from the current observation. We do this by these equations here, uh, where the updated posterior mean is calculated by mo modifying the predicted mean from before, our prior, with the correction term. You can view this as our old information that we have gotten from our previous measurements, and this as our new information that we get from the current observation. Similarly, the updated posterior covariance is calculated by using the predicted covariance and shrinking it by this factor, which is dependent on how informative the new observation is. In order to calculate the posterior mean and covariance, we make use of what we call the Kalman gain, the innovation, and the innovation covariance. All of these have important interpretations, which we will get back to soon. But before we do that, we should note that, as we indicated when we discussed the prediction step, only the posterior mean is dependent on data through this innovation term here, where we see that the data observation yk enters here, right? Which is not the case for when we calculate the posterior covariance. None of these expressions here are dependent on y. We can thus conclude that in a Kalman filter, only the estimate is a function of data, and not our uncertainty in our estimates. This is something that, in general, only holds true for the Kalman filter. Additionally, one can also note as a motivation for why the Kalman filter is important, is that it calculates the posterior mean. So it's both the minimum mean squared error and the maximum a posteriori estimator. Additionally, one can also note there's a motivation for why the comma filter is important, and that is because the comma filter calculates the estimate as the posterior mean, like this. Now, as the posterior is Gaussian, and that the mean of a Gaussian random variable coincides with the maximum of a Gaussian density, the comma filter is actually the optimal estimator, both in minimum mean squared error sense and in maximum a posteriori sense.